Imam uh, Shafi'i was born almost certainly in the town of Gaza, Gaza, uh, in Palestine. So Imam Shafi'i grows up in this rather poor uh, environment, uh, but with this noble lineage. And quite often you find some of the best people in the Islamic world are like that. They're noble, though they recognize that they are called to emulate the nobility of their ancestors, uh, uh, but they're not spoiled by wealth, which is the lot of, of, of the majority of people who have been given wealth. So he's in the city of Mecca and he's an orphan. His mother directs him to the circles of knowledge. By the age of seven, uh, we're told, by Imam al-Bayhaqi, he had memorized the Qur'an. By the age of ten, it seems that he had memorized at least one of the versions of the Muwatta of Imam uh, Malik. Um, and he used to love hadith and would go to the circles of the muhaddithin and memorize hadith just from hearing it. He couldn't afford books or to study in any other way. He just heard and heard and heard until he memorized the hadith. And then when he had to write things, he would write the hadith on pieces of broken pottery or on old pieces of leather or parchment. And it said that because he was poor, he couldn't afford to buy writing materials. So he used to hang around at the, the diwan of the governor of the city of Mecca, uh, asking for any old pieces of parchment or scrap. He had a strong inclination to speaking really classical, refined Arabic. He went out to the desert and sought out and kept the company of the tribe of Hudayl. Why Hudayl, amongst all the hundreds of Arabic tribes? Because they were the ones with the reputation for the purest and the most chaste Arabic. And so he spent time with them, according to some scholars, 10 years um, in the desert with, with Hudayl. So according to Ibn Kathir, great Shafi'i historian, he spends 10 years in the desert, and there, as well as perfecting his speech, he learns uh, horse riding uh, and also learns archery. And he becomes famous uh, for Rimaya, for archery. So later on in life, he says this, My focus, my love, my preoccupation was on th two things, in archery and knowledge. I was so good at archery that I would hit the target 10 times out of 10. But then he wouldn't talk about his scholarship. It's humble, it's not going to say that he's a great scholar. فَقَالُوا بَعْضُ الْحَاضِرِينَ And one of those who were present said, أَنْتَ وَاللَّهِ فِي الْعِلْمِ أَكْثَهُ مِنْكَ فِي الرَّمِي And he said, by Allah, you are more accurate in your scholarship than you are um, in archery. So he's a teenager, he's in the city of Mecca. Most of the teaching at the time is happening around the Kaaba in great circles of hadith and fiqh. Uh, and he studies in particular under somebody called Muslim bin Khalid al-Zanji, apparently an African scholar, who authorizes him when he's reached the age of 15 to give fatwas. Of course, in Islam, uh, to have an opinion that you give publicly, uh, you have to be authorized to do that. So at the age of 15, uh, Imam al-Shafi'i is being authorized to give fatwa in the shadow of, 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 of the Kaaba itself. But that wasn't enough. You might think the Gifatwa is about as far as it can go, uh, but he wanted more. The governor of Najran, which is the northernmost city in, in the Yemen, comes to Medina, uh, and he, he'd heard of a Shafi'i and employs him. So he goes back to Najran, and as a judge, he becomes one of those awkward individuals, and we saw this in the case of, of Sahnon last time, refusing to allow flattery, refusing to accept special pleading and refusing to accept bribes of any kind. So he very soon makes enemies, particularly since the, the governor, the Abbasid governor of, of, of the region is known as Zalum, he's really unjust and he's always trying to get the judge to bend to his wishes. Uh, and not only does Shafi'i refuse to do this, but he actually criticizes him publicly. The governor's outraged and wants to get rid of him. And the way he does this is to uh, invent charges uh, against Imam Shafi'i. So the governor writes to the Khalifa in Baghdad, claiming that Shafi'i is from the Shia. And of course, the fact that he has this Hashimi lineage makes that perhaps a little bit less far-fetched. But still, a governor writing about a relatively unknown person from 
the Muttalibi Hashimi lineage in a Yemeni city, writing to the Khalifa, that's a dangerous letter. And the governor does write uh, of Shafi'i, يَعْمَلُ بِلِسَانِهِ مَا لَا يَقْدِرُ عَلَيْهِ الْمُقَاتِلُ بِسَيْفِهِ With his tongue, he achieves that which a warrior couldn't achieve with his sword. That's what they're worried about. They're worried about people preaching uh, in a way that's subversive of the Abbasid political order. So he gets the word that he has to go to Baghdad. He's more or less under arrest with eight other revolutionaries. He's taken off to the city of Baghdad to appear before the Khalifa. One after the other, the other eight are, the historians tell us, uh, executed. Yeah. 